Okay, this lecture is devoted to what we call copywriting, which is one of the most uh, prevalent kind of jobs for a Marcom person and uh, is quite sought after today uh, in, in high tech and in many other fields. What is copywriting actually? It's writing um, content that motivates people to learn more about a product or to buy a product or to uh, somehow get involved with, uh, with some particular issue. It's meant to convince and persuade people to do something. That's really what copywriting is all about. Uh, the question is, how do we write effective copy? What, what, is, what are the rules? What are the basic principles that we need to learn? So let's look. The first thing is, know your product. If you're writing an advertisement or a sales letter, just, these are kinds of copywriting, or even if you're just writing a, a, a brochure, but you can't do it unless you really know the product well. Okay? Uh, you don't have to know all the technicalities, but you have to at least know the main features of the product. You have to know, understand very well the benefits, have a clear idea of the benefits that those features give people who buy the product. Understand the positioning of the product, and we already discussed that in earlier lectures, but positioning we means what's unique about your product. What, you know, when, when you look at it in relationship to other products, what makes it special? Okay? Understand that and get a clear idea of that uh, and what makes the product stand out from the crowd, which is basically the same thing. The, the, the idea is there's one salient feature that will make the product stand out and have a clear identity. And that's something you should know before you start writing the copy. Okay? Uh, copy needs to be written from knowledge, not from just kind of playing around with words and coming up with things that have nothing to do with the product or just from your own imagination, but which is far from what the people who made the product want to uh, convey. Okay, uh, another thing is uh, getting an idea of the what we call the brand image, to understand the promise of the brand. The brand is basically a, uh, a it's an emotional thing but it's it's a it's kind of an image that companies create regarding their products or themselves the company itself has a brand image uh, and it, 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 it basically uh, provides a kind of a promise the idea is that this particular kind of product or this particular company will make good on this promise whatever it is durability of its products or its uh, uh, ability to uh, to give you what you need and the least amount of uh, investment or whatever it is is there's a kind of an emotional appeal uh, it's usually related to the positioning and that brand image also needs to be understood by you uh, what is a company really pushing in terms of why their products are so great or what's so special about them um, what is that promise that if you buy their product you'll get what the other products don't give you okay now, once you get these basic ideas out, and 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 you you would probably un uncover these ideas in a first meeting with your client, if you're a freelance copywriter, uh, or if you're working in a company, of course, you would have more time to investigate and learn about all the products uh, that your company makes and uh, understand uh, the principles on which the pro uh, the products were based and this kind of thing. But even if you're a, a freelancer coming in from the outside, you you should have an initial interview which will give you clear idea of these things. Uh, one way also of uncovering this is actually to look at previous documentation or other kinds of brochures and things that they may have already in the company. That can also enable you to see what they are pushing. Um, you have to kind of read between the lines and analyze their copy, their extant copy, and, and try to s extract these various uh, ideas from the copy. Some of the copy might be very poor, but at least you want to try to get the basics uh, out of the copy. Okay, okay. Um, let's go on. Okay. All right, the second principle uh, is basically know your audience. Who are the people buying this thing? This is, of course, very important and it will influence the way you write your copy. Um, you know, if the people are going to look like these people in the picture here, 
which are, you know, looking at this the traditional American farmer type thing, uh, well, you're going to write the copy in one way. And if they are uh, young, high-tech people, uh, you're going to write it in a different way. Certain types of words, certain kind of approach uh, is needed for a particular audience. Uh, now, some companies invest in, in more than one brochure for a particular product, so it would go out to different markets. In other words, young people or older people or more traditional people. Uh, different copy can go to others, you know, to different markets that they've segmented. And other companies um, don't invest in that and they just want to put together one copy uh, for everybody. It's just a little more problematic because then you have to write in a tone and in a way that will reach everyone even though um, they're very different markets. Okay, but think of the typical, in high tech anyway, uh, you usually have a typical prospect. Most high tech people have the same educational background or similar, similar training, similar interests, and therefore um, you would normally use a similar approach in your copy if it's high tech. Okay, uh, you have to know, as we said before in an early lecture, you have to try to understand what their problems are, what do they want? What would interest them? All of these things are important uh, to understand uh, how to write the copy up, as we'll see. As we'll see with the different approaches that you can take when you're actually doing the writing. Okay? Uh, but you should try to clarify this at the beginning. Again, usually you can get this from a first interview, and you actually ask people who uses the product. What type of people are these? One question that I've asked oftentimes is, what, what did people do before they had your product? Like, why did you make your product? You know, were, were they unsatisfied or dissatisfied with what the existing solution was and, and why? Okay, so maybe the existing solution was too slow, maybe it wasn't comprehensive enough, maybe there was no solution actually. Um, what do they want? Why, why, you know, why does your product fulfill uh, or, or, you know, satisfy them? Uh, find out that and uh, what interests them. What is their main thing? Some people are really interested in power. Other people are interested in speed, uh, efficiency, and, and getting ahead. This kind of thing. Each type of prospect has different uh, interests, as we'll soon see. Okay, as I said, some people. <laughs> My, your audience, instead of these farmers, might be some young people like this in the picture. Um, these people uh, obviously will respond to a different kind of copy than, than the people in the first picture. And I'll just to illustrate the point, uh, let's go on to the next slide. Okay, so we could start with asking ourselves, why do people buy anything? And I've mentioned this before, but I want to go over it again in more depth here. There actually two parts to a purchase. One is how people justify their purchases. Okay, they appeal to reason. They say, well, I'm buying this because it's you know less costly, it's more efficient, uh, because it's going to uh, further my business interests or whatever. They may have very scientific reasons actually for uh, justifying their purchases. However, the actual buy, according to most people, is done, uh, is based on emotion, okay, feeling. Um, either something of what we call, we can build, base, basically divide feelings into two general categories, and I just call them greed and fear, so you just remember them better. I mean, you can call them something more sophisticated if you want, but greed meaning any kind of desire, anything you want that would be you know beneficial to you. It could be money, it could be power, it could be status, etc. Uh, fear is anything that you don't want, that you're afraid of, you know, losing the things that I just mentioned, uh, and, and you know, the insecurities that, uh, that we're all uh, exposed to in daily life. So, the emotional part of why we purchase something is uh, actually the main motivation, but we normally try to cover up those emotional things with justifications that appeal to all kinds of reasons that we come up with to justify our purchases. It's the same for everything. I mean, uh, it's the same thing for elections, for example, also, you know, when the, the election the, in 2016, the previous election, um, well, we're talking about, uh, you know, electing uh, Trump or Clinton, uh, there might be all kinds of reasons that people would give uh, based on very flimsy kind of research into the uh, biographies of each of these people. But the main reason they vote for them is some kind of an emotion. 
Okay, some kind of emotion just feels right to vote for this one or that one because you feel that they're going to get you somewhere. They're going to somehow it's more in your interest. You're going to get more out of things, uh, or because you're afraid that the other one is going to take you back into some uh, something worse than what you have. So even though people, when they argue which one you should you know vote for, they will give all kinds of oftentimes all kinds of so-called reasons but really there's just a gut intuition that you're going to go for this or that one not based on any reason really except you're just raw emotional feeling uh, and of course when uh, people run campaigns they they try to target that emotion okay they target on the emotional level uh, they know that people will always come up with some justifications but the emotional level is what really motivates them to vote one way or another and it's the same thing with purchasing also I mean, in this election, really, the, the marketing of the candidates is actually in, in line with all the principles of copywriting and Markham. Uh, that is really what uh, the modern uh, election system seems to be, more than about discussing issues in a rational way. Okay, well, the, the emotion of desire can be broken into uh, or divided into various uh, categories. Um, on the one hand, we have prestige. Okay, which is basically status. Uh, this feeling that oh, if I buy this, I'm gonna, you know, this car is gonna make me look better. I'm gonna have more prestige, more status with people, uh, with my friends, with my boss. I mean, there are some people who uh, I've known who have their own businesses and they buy a, a, a nice fancy car because they have to go in, uh, out to clients and they have to look good because the client wants to see somebody who's serving them who looks very successful and wealthy they don't want somebody coming in with an old beat up car even though it might be working fine and it might not disturb the person who's driving it but it doesn't look good okay so i've had people uh that i know who would spend and go into debt uh for buying something fancy because it's important for their business uh so status is an important thing uh, power power is very important people want more control over their lives, over others, uh, over their businesses, um, and who knows what else. But um, many times, high-tech people want power. When they're programming, they want to have more power over their um, over their computers and over their their computer software. And so, power is one of the words, control and power, that you'll see a lot in high-tech copy, as we'll soon see. Uh, it's one of the uh, buzzwords that, that go again and again, the powerful this and the powerful that. You can think how, you know, why are we talking about power all the time when we're talking about computers, but it seems like that is a, a, a main desire of computer people. Ambition, of course, getting ahead, dreams for the future. This is also very important to uh, copy can be built around giving people this feeling that they're going to uh, actualize themselves somehow or they're going to get ahead uh, in, in their life in some way. Money is obviously a, a principal desire in many areas. Uh, if you invest in something, if you buy this, and you will actually have more money, uh, either because it's uh, less expensive and you'll be saving or because somehow it's going to generate money for you. Um, love, affection, liking, acceptance is also something that I think is uh, obviously many products appeal to people because they feel that if they have them, uh, they're going to get more, uh, they're going to attract people. Um, and all the fashion products and uh, beauty products and the kind of things like that are actually built on this. Uh, if you have a certain kind of, uh, you know, a hairspray or whatever, I mean, you'll get more affection, people will like you, you'll look better, and people will love you, and you'll be more accepted. If you have a better mouthwash, you'll be more accepted. You know, uh, if you dress a certain way, you might meet the love of your life, whatever it is, but. It, this is what drives the fashion industry and beauty products and cosmetics and things like that. This is obviously one of the main desires that people have. Comfort and ease is another one which is good for all kinds of people, high-tech as well as low-tech stuff. Um, with high-tech, it's uh, over and over again. It's, uh, you know, with just the click of a button or all you need to do is uh, this and that and, and your job will be made so much easier and you you know just be sitting back in the computer will do everything for you um, and uh, this is obviously one of the driving forces behind uh, uh, computer products but it also is good for for many other things uh, whether it's uh, home appliances or uh, uh, any, anything to do with uh, 
really lots of low-tech products are built around the idea that if you buy this, you'll just have a more comfortable life. It's just going to be much easier to conduct your daily routines or do whatever you need to do. Uh, so that's uh, another key thing that you can build copy around. Now, the idea is here, here is that you can obviously mix some of these. Much copy, as we'll see, we'll mix some of these together. It's not like there's one thing only. But oftentimes, it's good to try to select the main idea here. This usually relates to the positioning of the product, uh, to the kind of audience it's going to, and that brand promise. Okay, so you know you would probably narrow down one of these as the main, uh, the, the main idea that you're going to hammer in, hammer on, and that's what we call the message, the main message. And then there'll be some secondary messages which will also enhance the copy too. Okay, as we'll soon see. All right, another thing is fear. That's the other great emotion. People are worried, you know, they're going to lose money, they're going to go bankrupt, they're going to go, they're going to gamble away everything, as you see the people here at the gambling table. They don't know. You know, you just don't know what's going to come up. All, all of life is a bit of a gamble. And so fear, insurance salesman plays on fear. Oh, you know, somebody might die and then uh, you're going to be left without any money and this kind of thing. you got to buy insurance. Uh, health insurance, what happens if you get sick and then you'll be in hospital, who's going to pay for that? Well, these things all play on our fear. Uh, sometimes the fear is rational, there's rational, uh, but again, well, I'm talking about the emotional level. You don't buy things because it's just rational. Uh, if it, that would be the case, well, if, if by rationality is, you know, your, your chances of getting sick or whatever, but certain things are like one out of, uh, I don't know, 300,000, well, it might be not rational to put so much away uh, in insurance every month uh, because the chances are that it's very low that you'll get any problem and you have any problem. But the emotional level is telling you, well, but maybe it'll happen. Maybe something will happen to me and then where will I going to be? So that's where they play on the fear idea. But you can play on that in anything. If you don't buy your child this encyclopedia, well, it might be okay, but, you know, uh, he may be left behind. He may not know as much as his classmates. He may be not doing as well in school. You need this educational product. Well, the chances are you can probably be use other ways of enhancing his education. But again, there's all this gnawing fear that maybe, just maybe, that this is the key to everything and you don't want to take a chance with your child. So it's usually things that they, the fear element usually plays on things where you have a strong attachment. Children, uh, your spouse, your house, you know, maybe you want earthquake insurance or whatever. Uh, things like that that you just have this emotional, this gut feeling, you've got to do something to protect, even if the chances that something will happen are so remote. Okay. Fear of losing any of the above things that we had in the last slide, of the desirable things, is obviously one of the things of fear. It just basic insecurities is something that people play on as well. All right, messages is another important area that we have to get into. The, the, I mentioned it just a moment, moment ago. The idea of a message is that uh, you you realize that one of these things in the desire uh, uh, category, in the desire list, or maybe one of these fears that we mentioned before, is going to be the main thing you're going to concentrate on. And that's what's called the main message. The main message. Uh, it's what you are going to write the copy around. Now, this is very important to understand that the message is not the same thing as the actual copy. The message is the idea behind the copy. The copy that you write are the words. It could be rhyming words, it could be really clever words, it could be sophisticated stuff. It might sound like some an academic article, if it's going to academic editions, and if it's going to uh, people that are not that uh, educated, then it might sound like, you know, down on the farm type stuff. It doesn't matter. The same message might be behind all of these. So the copy can be expressed in, it will express the message in different ways. But the message needs to be clear in your mind before you write the copy. Because the idea is that if you have a clear message, and then you will find ways of expressing it one way or another to different types of audiences or in different ways. Uh, but if you don't know what you are trying to convey, then just writing a lot of fancy words or coming up with some clever phrases won't really do anything much because you don't know if you're really hitting the right message, if you're getting conveying the right message. For example, Volkswagen had a clear message uh, that it would save you a lot of money. When it first came out, the little Volkswagen back in the 60s, that was that suddenly you have this car that saves you money. 
Whereas other cars were getting bigger and bigger, the messages was bigger is better, more comfort. They were concentrating on comfort and ease and prestige, you know, status and that kind of thing back then in the States. Uh, the idea of the Volkswagen, they just had a different message. The message was, we're going to save you money. Uh, we're going to prevent you from going into debt. You know, it's great comfort and ease is all great, you know, when economies is booming, when things are not booming, you know, you have to think in different terms. So it was a revolution, a revolution idea to come up with a new message and a totally different kind of car that didn't look prestigious. It looked kind of funny and little and, you know, what is this supposed to be? Uh, but it totally, re totally revolutionized the way of the cars were being sold at that time. Easy to drive was another thing. You know, and you can get to the smallest parking spaces. Uh, so that instead of just driving this big, you know, these, these, these cars, we have a, a place near me uh, where it has lots of antique cars are parked there in a, in a certain garage. And you see the cars from back in the, uh, in the 60s and 70s. I mean, they are these look like huge boats, you know. I mean, they're tremendous. The size of them is amazing. Um, but that whole idea kind of fizzled out over time. I mean, maybe there are some uh, big cars today, of course, that are uh, on a very high end, but most of the time we're looking for more compact or better, what we call better design kind of cars, because the older ones were more concerned with prestige and status and the idea that I'm a big guy on the road, whereas today uh, many people just want a, a car that uh, uh, fits into smaller spaces or is more manageable, more manageable, that kind of thing. This is a total revolution in message. Right? It's very, very, very different.